Welcome everyone to the very last Wu University uh, event of 2021. And of course, we save the best for last. Dr. Chang and I are basically brother and sister. We always uh, joke around that we're, we're, we're siblings. And I'm so excited to be here with him and his amazing colleague, Dr. Ayers, which a lot of you guys have been very excited to hear from as well. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this evening. Dr. Brandon Ayers uh, is, has been on staff at the Cornea Service at Will's Eye Hospital, where he's the co-director of the fellowship program. During his first year as an attending physician on the Cornea Service, he became the youngest recipient of the Golden Apple Award at Will's Eye. Dr. Ayers specializes in all forms of corneal transplantation and complex cataract surgery. He was the first physician at Will's Eye Hospital to perform a decimase membrane endothelial keratoplasty. He also lectures and instructs courses both nationally and internationally. And we've also gotten some comments as we were advertising for this event that he is the guy, the cornea guy that a lot of doctors refer to that are listening in on this call. So they're, they're very, very excited to hear from you, Dr. Ayers. And then we've also got Clark Chang. Dr. Clark Chang is the director of the specialty lens department in the cornea department at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. He is the host of the popular po podcast show, Chang Reaction. With over a decade of research experience in corneal cross-linking and other advanced corneal treatments, he was selected as the top doctor of 2020 by the National Keratoconus Foundation, and he is also the 2021 recipient of AOA's Luminary Award for Distinguished Practice. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ayers and Dr. Chang to tonight's program. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thanks, you Stephanie. Think, Brendan, that I had to uh, throw in everything that I've earned so far in order to compete with all the awards that you've earned. <laughs> Those uh, are like the only two things I've ever, I've ever been given. Um, in any uh, no, case, they sound pretty good, Clark. <laughs> thank you. Uh, in any case, I know we have a large um, audience online, which I, I feel very privileged, privileged to be here, uh, both with you and with them tonight. Um, so just to open here, Brendan, um, I wanted to show everybody this table. Um, and as you can see from the citation, everyone, this is a, a TFOS flow chart. And why are we showing this uh, a dry eye, you know, workflow chart in a neuro, in a, a NK or neurotrophic keratitis course? Well, if you look at least, at the very least, if you, you know, look over to the left half of the section of the flow chart with the two blue boxes, you could see that neurotrophic conditions is listed side by side with patient with potentially predisposition to dry eyes. And what does that mean? That means that there is some uh, overlapping presentations there where you could have patients um, appear with corneal signs of maybe dry eye or other epithelial compromises, maybe defects that uh, signals potential neurotrophic, but they don't have symptoms. And so a lot of times it is very possible we should all challenge ourselves to do this. And that is, you know, whenever you have nerve dysregulations of uh, an organ and they're overlapping um, manifestations with other diseases that they share a characteristic of, and if you're treating it as say dry eye, because that's more common than NK, make sure that you do challenge your diagnosis if patients are not responding to your treatment. Um, is there, do you have any other pearls on this uh, flow chart, uh, Brendan, how it affects your practices, how it should maybe? Well, you know, the uh, there's been so many uh, attempts to make a flow chart that will work for for everybody. And, and you have your lumpers and splitters, and clearly this is a splitter type of flow chart. But it really shows that there is so many different components to ocular surface disease. Now we're talking about neurotrophic keratitis tonight. And in all honesty, I may actually slip and say something like dry eye or, or something of that nature. The purpose is NK, but 
NK is part of the larger spectrum of ocular surface disease. So these are a, a family that kind of runs together with all these comorbid conditions. And I think that'll become clear as we go through the, you know, the presentation tonight. But look how broad this, this diagram is. You go from one end, which is pain with no stain, which where you know the, the patient has so much discomfort, which we also think is neurogenic in in uh, in uh, etiology, to stain with no pain. So we go from overactive nerves to underactive nerves, and on both ends of the spectrum, it's a major problem. But our focus is going to be on the left side of this chart tonight, and hopefully we can unravel some of the mystery of treatment of the uh, neurotrophic cornea. Yeah, that sounds good. So let's get started. So I guess the question we really should start asking ourselves, if we're saying, hey, there's a lot of overlapping characteristic of different ocular surface manifestation or syndrome or diseases, then what exactly is NK? And I think we really, it's time that we really, you know, say what it, say, you know, say what it is. And that is to me, NK is a degenerative disease uh, involving neural dysregulation, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, that downstream leads to corneal manifestation, uh, including um, corneal sensitivity diminution. So not, no, doesn't, I didn't say absolute absence. So it, that's not completely necessary in every single case, but leading to diminution in corneal sensitivity that then eventually give rise to uh, a seemingly unprovoked epithelial compromises paired with uh, characteristic of slow healing, if healing at all. So I think those are the check boxes that we really should be thinking about when we're thinking, huh, is this dry eye? Is this other something else on the cornea or is this possibly NK? And we're going to talk about other risk factors to assess as well, but you can now understand why it has that characteristic um, appearance of central or infrocentral uh, epithelial defect with kind of heaped up gray edge. The location can be at least in my mind, answered by the fact that we have a lot more neural innervation terminals centrally in the cornea versus peripheral. So if anything's going to happen due to a dysregulation of the cornea, you're obviously going to see it more centrally first. And when the homeostasis, and by that, I mean, you know, I know we, we hear a lot, a lot of that when we're discussing dry eye and ocular surface diseases. So, so what exactly does that mean in its implication to NK? Um, I think we're much more used to, accustomed to thinking about the efferent um, flow of things. And by that, I mean, you know, trophic support, exoplasmic flow, we think of it as going from your central nervous system to your peripheral nervous system and then to your peripheral end organ. A lot of us don't think of, don't think about the afferent loop that is going from the ocular surface, tear film included, epithelium, keratocyte, back to the, uh, the nerve. And what that ha what happens there is that you have Healthy, care, healthy keratocytes and epitheliums can release neurotrophins, nerve growth factor that regulates or very important uh, in the proliferation and the health of the corneal nerves. And so, you know, NK can also happen, understand that it doesn't always have to be an efferent disorder. It could also be an afferent disorder when you have chronic inflammation and dryness or blink reflex issues. Uh, that kind of thing can also eventually lead to NK. So again, hold your thought on that because we're going to talk a lot about all the other um, predisposing comorbidities and risk factors. But talking about needing the importance of um, healthy keratocytes and epithelium cells, then we must then also understand that is the reason we need to be very careful and very protective with our corneal stem cells, because obviously that is the, that's the origin of our epithelium cells that we need in order to maintain the, a healthy barrier that gives proper feedback back to the corneal nerves. Um, and that's the reason why, you know, whenever we're giving a treatment, we need to think about corneal epithelial cell, but also limbal stem cells. And the, in tracing more upstream back to the origin of uh, corneal nerves, it's, you know, we need to kind of, uh, I know many of us may not have looked at a diagram like this bef uh, for a long time, which is, you know, tracing from your uh, CN5 or cranial nerve or trigeminal nerve nucleus all the way to ophthalmic branch, giving rise to your ciliary nerves. And those uh, ciliary nerves eventually um, insert themselves 
uh, through limbo area uh, in the uh, stromal region, forming, ner uh, forming nerve uh, plexus, and then taking a vertical turn, going towards superficial epithelium on its way, forming your subepithelial plexus, the basal, we, we talk about that a lot, and we're going to throughout this lecture as well. And then with terminal endings that either ends within or between superficial epithelial cells. And why is that important? That is important because that means anywhere along the pathway with disruption to your trigeminal nerve pathway um, can cause potentially um, neurotrophic keratitis. Um, Brandon, I know you like this diagram a lot. Is there anything else that you insights that you want to add to this? <laughs> yeah, I actually I hate diagrams, and I look at these, uh -huh. and it reminds me of med school, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I remember all these pathways. But you're right, Clark, and I, I think that 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 the corneal nerves and the nervous system in general gets a little bit sidelined by the other transport systems in the body: the lymphatic system, the vascular system, blood vessels. Um, don't forget that that nerves have axonal transport. They're not just the wires in the house that hit that reflex. They actually have that axioplasmic flow that takes towards the, you know, it takes away from the, the cell body and brings back. So they're actually a transport system for nutrients and waste in the cornea. So when we're talking about neurotrophic keratitis, and we'll give a lot of time today to, to recombinant nerve growth factor, Nerve growth factor is, not, is actually a, a, a trophic support for the epithelium, and there's receptors all over the ocular surface, not just on the corneal epithelium. It's in the conjunctiva, it's in the lacrimal glands. But loss of those nerves isn't just loss of sensation. It's loss of the ability of the cornea to transport waste products and bring nutrients to the epithelium. So in that subbasal nerve plexus and subepithelial plexus that we'll see on confocal microscopy later on, when those nerves are gone, that is really detrimental to the health of the ocular surface because it's not only losing reflexes, it's losing a transport system for waste and nutrients. So don't think of nerves just as electricity. They are also a transport system for uh, involved in the health of the ocular surface. Yeah, that's such a good point. And we'll definitely come back and talk a little more about that as well. But, be, but here to summarize all the boring stuff that I said, uh, which is obviously any if we have any type of impairment or disruption to your trigeminal innervation anywhere along the path, then you're more likely to lead to impairment to um, your blink reflexes from like Brian, uh, like Brandon had mentioned, or or the um, trans the transporting system, the transportation system of the trophic support, leading to epithelium compromises, slow healing characteristic, as I mentioned earlier, and also possibly just lack of the protection and chronic inflammation and insult from inability to produce enough tear or to blink properly and leading to that seemingly unprovoked, which really is not unprovoked. It's just the mechanism is a couple steps removed from when we're looking at the slit lamp. And so it may not be as obvious leading to this picture of NK. So then, you know, we him and hawed about, well, there are different risk factors. And, and just in case many of you may still be thinking, you know, I, I, I like Dr. Ayers and that's the reason why I'm listening to, uh, to this lecture. I honestly don't even think that um, we, I have any type of NK patients in my clinic. Just look at these risk factors, right? History is where it all begins. We know that 90, 95% of our, a lot of our diagnoses really come from patient complaints and history. So if you look at the ocular history, it is estimated that about 12.8% of zoster patients post uh, episode uh, are likely to develop NK and about half of that. So let's say about 6% of uh, simplex patients um, can have uh, predisposition predisposition to develop NK, but let's just say that you don't even think you have that many herpes, herpetic eye disease patients, right? But how many of those patients we have have had ocular surgeries, whether refractive surgery or, uh, you know, cataract surgery or other surgery were disrupting potentially, maybe for a short period of time, but uh, potentially longer in terms of their sub uh, basal plexus that I had mentioned. How many of the contact lens patients were wearing lenses, you know, for their throughout their lifetime until they go to uh, 
cataract surgery and think about the burden that we're adding to the ocular surface, and especially those who abuse these content lenses, right? So if you think of, if you look through this ocular risk factor list, I'm not saying that, obviously we're not saying a equals B, that you know, just if you have one or two of these things, you absolutely will have NK, but the risk of NK definitely increases. But that's also say, how about systemic comorbidities or associations? How many diabetes, you know, diabetic patients do we have in our practice? I bet you all of you have lots, right? And again, we'll talk a little bit later about what that means to the cornea in the expert opinion when we talk about a study that was done via a Delphi panel delivery um, and deliberation process. But again, a lot of diabetes patients, I mean, it's an endemic in US, so I don't think I need to uh, tell all of our, uh, us on the call here on the on the. Uh, uh, conference here that we have lots of those patients with potential risk factors. What about central nerve system, right? Anywhere along that path of the trigeminal nerve pathway, uh, even just those with intro, intracranial incidents, right? Stroke patients, your aneurysm patients, or your patient who say intracranial procedures, maybe acoustic ar aroma, a neuroma, I'm sorry, or um, so it doesn't even need to be anything as exotic as you're imagining. And I would say probably the probably the least common to be seen in the primary care level is the genetics. Um, patient with genetic predisposition or risk factors, because I've seen some at, in cornea service at Wales Eye, um, but obviously, you know, again, I completely understand that may be the group of patients that we see the least. And so we may not be as familiar with that, but luckily Brendan is. So I'm going to get Brendan to describe his case for us. Well, you know, I think that these cases are, uh, uh, are such a challenge. And, and really, if you are an eye care practitioner and in your mind you're saying, I really don't think I want to manage neurotrophic keratitis, when you look at that list of diagnoses and comorbid conditions that Clark just went through, uh, if you don't want to deal with NK, you basically have to get a different job because <laughs> there's so many comorbidities that, that are so common, um, it's unavoidable. And you can't really treat NK if you don't diagnose it. And to diagnose it, you're going to have to check corneal sensation. So it just shows the importance of, of keeping it top mind, uh, especially now that we have some better treatments for NK. But this case here was basically the, the Friday afternoon, you know, bomb drop you know, a couple of weeks ago where this very young 19 year old uh, patient with a history of congenital insensitivity to pain. So here we're not talking about something like Mobius syndrome or familial dysautonomia. And those, those patients have syndromes that are somewhat recognizable. And even if you don't quite know it that well, a quick Google search will say, oh, you know, this also has, you know, a, a neurogenic source. So watch for it, look for the corneal sensation. Well, here, this is my second patient that has no sensation anywhere on the body. And this patient was expertly managed outside Will's Eye Hospital initially and then sent to us. No sensation on either cornea or anywhere. And look, you can already see there's, there's corneal, central corneal opacities in both corneas with corneal vascularization. You can see those, those defects on the lip. This is not a cleft lip or cleft palate kind of problem. That's simply because this poor child has has basically bit his lip enough times and had infections enough times that that the the lip is basically going away. Now I have other patients. Well, luckily I only have a handful of patients who have a similar syndrome, but are now older. And what we'll see is is without the ability to have any sensation, the eyes are just part of the problem. We'll end up losing fingers and toes and arms and legs, and then eventually it'll likely be the, the source of their, their demise. There's also some cognitive issues with these patients at all, and I don't think they have a very long life expectancy. But it's such a, an interesting look into how important nerves are and how important sensation is, not only in the corneas, but just for life and living and keeping our fingers and toes and staying healthy. Uh, we're going to have to watch this child very, very closely, keep a close watch on these corneas. And almost no matter what we do without the ability to have any sensation, most of our treatments will maybe prolong the, the, the life of the cornea or the health of the cornea, but 
any surgical intervention is going to take longer to heal. And if we really want to get this child to see again, it will likely require a corneal transplant. Now, imagine how difficult it will be to get a corneal transplant to heal when there's no sensation. You know, an uphill battle for this poor child, but we'll do everything that we can for him. But these syndromes do, do exist. We do see them, and they are very challenging to treat. And Brenda, that's such a good point because I actually have had patients that you're describing similar to uh, the one, this case that you're showing, who is now an adult. And, um, you know, this patient that I have also, they couldn't, they, she actually happens to have skin nodules all over her body and they've said they biopsy the nodules and still couldn't figure out why she has hypoesthesia over her body. And she had, because of that, she under, um, eye issue, she had to undergo a couple corneal transplants because they keep failing very quickly. Um, so my point being that if you are seeing this type of patient, and not just say as a contact lens practice, um, if this patient comes to, you know, one of the, our colleagues chair, and are you proposing that we should co-manage other symptoms in, you know, other system, systematic symptoms that this person may be having with another specialist? Uh, and what in, if that if yes, then which discipline do you refer to? Well, you know, a condition like this is is absolutely multidisciplinary. I mean, this is not somebody that that can be a, is a one doctor wonder. And I think this this needs to be managed with you know be, between cornea to watch the surface. Uh, I think specialty contact lenses certainly play a strong role in cases like this because we've got to cover these corneas and try and get this patient to see. Now, granted, that would be very challenging in an 18 month old. But if we can preserve the corneas and preserve vision long enough that we can get family members or, or someone to help and get contact lenses in this patient or help manage bandage lenses or even the drops, I mean, this it is such an immense amount of work. They also need to be closely followed by their, of course, their primary care physician, infectious disease. You have to get the dentist involved, orthopedics involved. I mean, this, this requires everyone's help. Now, luckily, these conditions are fairly rare, so this is likely not not going to just simply, you know, get dropped into the office and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, what's going on? I'm seeing all these patients with congenital and sensitivity and sensitivity to pain. But when you do see them, or if you do see them, I mean, this really belongs in the specialty clinic. But it just reminds me of, of how important it is to look for sensation. And, you know, almost every specialty could take a patient like this and say, you know, look how important sensation is for the skin or for the fingers or for the teeth or for the gums or for whatever. In our case, we're focusing on the corneas, but this is going to push NK to the limits and it's going to take every treatment that we have available to make the patient healthy and it will definitely be multidisciplinary, even multidisciplinary within, within eye care. Right. Right. No, completely agree. And because of that, obviously, luckily, as you said, that is the most rare group with genetic linkage uh, and association. But there are still a lot of other patients that we could see with NK uh, comorbidities and associations in the primary care level. Um, however, the problem is, again, that variability overlapping um, variations of the corneal manifestations where you could have something that's very punctated, uh, you know, superficial SPK kind of appearance that makes you think dry eye to that very infracentral or central persistent epithelial defect with heaped up uh, and gray raised edges that we had that's more classically described. So then what really is the best way then to detect and monitor these patients? And as Brendan alluded before, we must, uh, it's simple to do, we need to be testing corneal sensitivity with at least whenever that suspicion arises. And obviously not everybody's gonna have Cochet Bonnet uh, in the clinic. And we definitely came up with other ways. And Brendan has uh, uh, prepared a special video for you for you to um, see what other ways that we could um, conduct this kind of test uh, in a few slides. So I'm gonna sort of throw that out as a teaser, but at the very least, Patient symptoms, right? Again, 95% or somewhat uh, 90 something percent of our diagnosis can come from patient interview. Um, so patient may actually come to you at the stage where they're not really having a whole lot of symptoms, meaning maybe they're not complaining of discomfort and pain, but they may complain of uh, symptom changes or fluctuation in their vision. Because remember, we talked about the fact that the ocular surface could possibly not uh, be in a homeostasis uh, type of situation. So watch out for those patients. Again, if you're treating these patients a dry eye and they don't respond and they have irregular 
corneal profile, maybe not even persistent defect, but their cornea, the epithelium changes, and you can observe that on topography, then maybe think about testing uh, corneal nerves. How about ocular surface stains? Again, if they're, they're usually different patterns. If they're more located in your inferior one third, that may look more like a lack of thalmas or lips, uh, well, your lit seal type of issue um, versus, you know, um, where NK, we talked about the fact that the corneal innervation more centrally. So typically it's gonna be more of a central or diffuse looking type of uh, staining pattern. Um, and then uh, obviously the Lissaman green can show um, more dry patients in the, uh, over the conjunctiva uh, when you're trying to differentiate between them. And Brendan, you had also mentioned that a lot of your NK patients, sometimes you see that epithelial ridge. Can you describe that for us? Yeah, so I've gotten myself in trouble a couple times. And this is where I think neurotrophic keratitis and herpetic disease can often get confused one for the other. Or, and sometimes they're actually, you, you know, the, the, the neurotrophic status of the cornea is due to HSV. But that, that elevated epithelial ridge, or what I call a neurotrophic ridge in my cornea, tends to be in the central or paracentral cornea, right in the interpalpebral zone where you'll get this just area of elevated non-healing epithelium. It can look very dendritic in nature. Really all it is is heaped up epithelium. It's elevated off the surface. You'll get some positive and negative staining. It can look a lot like a dendrite. And I've seen many patients come in with, you know, a question of is this herpetic or is this zoster? Is this a pseudodendrite? And all it is is just that the epithelium can't quite remodel itself and adding some kind of therapy for NK or ocular surface disease, plugs, tears, serum, bandage lenses, whatever it is, will allow that epithelial ridge to, to, to heal over. And I've gotten myself in trouble there, uh, you know, with this in taking care of somebody with, say, Salzman's nodules or bad anterior basement membrane dystrophy, where, you know, I'm moving a little bit too fast in the office and I see these other associated ocular surface diseases and say, hey, we can take care of this by doing a superficial keratectomy. So we make a very large epithelial defect, which should heal in three days, maybe four days, certainly within a week. And we find ourselves at week two and week three still battling a relatively comfortable patient who complains of poor vision. And you look at the surface and sure enough, you see this very beaten up ocular surface that's just not healing well. And then you have to just escalate your therapy to uh you know to get that patient to see and here you're worried because you know a non-healing epithelial defect or rough epithelium over the course of time is going to lead to corneal haze that may take a very long time to go away or not go away and become a scar so by trying to help somebody and moving maybe a little bit too quickly not checking sensation i sort of dug myself into a hole and i've done it more than once so clearly i don't learn that quickly um so looking for that ridge, I think, is really an important indicator of a more severe neurotrophism and needs treatment. Yeah, great point. And another way of uh, maybe helping you while you're doing your slit lamp examination, if you're still wondering, you know, should I, should I not? And in case your technician has not instilled any topical anesthetic while you could still perform corneal sensitivity tests, uh, another clue in the slit lamp may be looking at the patient's reflex. Um, obviously, we talked about the disruption to your trigeminal, trigeminal nerve and can affect the innervation to the uh, to a, a kind of to a, such a way that it affects your bling reflex. Um, so, if you have enough, you look at the you know uh, risk factors that we discuss. You look at some of these corneal staining patterns and. Um, and bling reflexes you that has been reduced. You may want to, you may start thinking, okay, I don't have Coche Bonnet, but I would like to test corneal sensitivity testing. But also I think a very interesting problem lately in sort of this COVID era where patients may be hyper alert about sterility. Brendan, do you have you changed any way that you you practice in terms of testing for these uh, for corneal sensitivity and and uh, what do you do? <laughs> Yeah, so I think we've changed almost everything in the way we practice over the past couple of years, or at least so it seems. And it's even still, you know, I, we are still in the midst of this pandemic. It's very much changed our approach to patients and how we uh, we are testing for neurotrophic keratitis. And so I actually have a video that we made more at the beginning of the pandemic, and that'll probably become clear about how we approach patients in this era where we're trying to to diagnose 
a disease that requires a touch to the patient and patients don't want you anywhere near them and we're trying to stay six feet away from everybody. So let's play the video, Clark, and uh, you guys just enjoy the next three minutes. No problem. I won't be silent during the video because the audio is... Diagnoses such as neurotrophic keratitis, slip limb exam is not enough. Knowing the status of the corneal sensation can help guide diagnosis and treatment. Now, over the past couple of months, the world's been turned on its head by the COVID-19 virus. Office parking lots have turned into triage centers, and the use of personal protective equipment helps protect the doctor from the patients and the patients from the doctor. Prior to the coronavirus pandemic, we would simply use a non-sterile cotton-tipped applicator. Pandemic, we would simply use a non-sterile cotton-tipped applicator uh, from the office to help check corneal sensation. By pulling some of the fibers out of the end of the cotton-tipped applicator and then creating a small cattail, the fibers could be carefully touched to the patient's cornea, which would then give some indication as to whether there was a reduction in sensation and how much that reduction was. Although it wasn't quantitative, it did give a good qualitative assessment as to corneal sensation. Another common technique was to simply tear a tissue and again create a small cattail which could gently be touched against the cornea. But as you can see, these are not sterile products and not a sterile procedure. So recently we have switched to using sterile procedures to check corneal sensation, or at least more sterile. One is using a two by two gauze, and you can carefully open the gauze, and you can see here we're using gloves, not bare hands to do this. And by pinching the corner of the gauze, a couple of the fibers can be released. This can then be twisted into a cattail, and that little cattail can then be used carefully to check corneal sensation. Another technique we've been using is sterile cotton-tipped applicators. In this case, part of the casing is clear, so you can see where the end of the cotton tip is. And even before it's completely opened, we can try to pull a few fibers out of the end of the cotton tip to create the cattail for checking corneal sensation. The packaging is quite slippery and it makes it a bit challenging, but this is at least a lot cleaner and more sterile than using bare hands and non-sterile equipment. Now, if patients demand sterility, and I do not necessarily recommend this technique, but you can take a needle and push it through the end of the cotton tip. This way we are completely sterile, and then that needle is used to pull some fibers out of the cotton tip. Now again, I've only used this technique a handful of times in patients who are at high risk of infection or demanded a more sterile technique. But here we have our cotton tip ready to go to check corneal sensation. At the slit lamp on a non-anesthetized cornea, these small fibers can be used to gently touch the cornea, and as soon as the patient blinks, you know they were able to feel the, the fiber. So these are just a few techniques that we've been using in the post-COVID-19 era to check corneal sensation, ensuring patient and doctor safety. Great. So, I mean, we went through, Brandon had taken us through a few, diff a few different techniques and some that he recently uh, adapted. And it's also interesting knowing that um, you could have there, there's also a development in the non-contact, in a non-contact gas esthesiometer that uses different mixture of gas uh, that can possibly, um, possibly um, customize the composition of the gas to actually test different nociceptors, right? Remember I talked about the nerve pathway, how it has uh, terminal endings within uh, or in between epithelial nerves. There are different receptors that are situated at different locations that possibly this can be even more sensitive to if should we want to do that. And another, um, another, um, instrument that may be not as readily available in, our, in a primary care setting would be a confocal microscopy, where here we have a patient actually, a post-surgical patient after refractive surgery that was diagnosed with NK, um, or at least suspected, and was actually after corneal sensitivity testing with cotton tip in the, in the chair was sent for a confocal microscopy. And you can see how Few, uh, the very low density of the subbasal nerve uh, plexus in uh, this patient. So because that there's no more awareness of the um, 
an urgency to treat these patients. And now that we have better treatment modalities, such as Sunujimin that uh, Brendan's gonna talk about a little bit later, there's the recently a Delphi panel um, that got together and talked about, well, then when do we really need to kind of test for corneal sensitivity? And this summarizes some of the things that we have really said, and which is obviously if there's persistent um, delay, pers you know, uh, persistent defect with delay healing, I feel like that 14 days is really generous just like uh, Brendan said, it, you know, it used to be like if we're, if I'm managing a, say a post PRK patient, if they don't heal within seven days, you start wondering when, at what point are you going, even with a protection advantage lens, at what point are you going to get, start getting some haze. And so, you know, I think this is just being more conservative because it, it, it's a classic answer. Um, but and before I, in, you know, invite Brendan to maybe make comments on their findings, I do want to say that I feel like at the very least there, something that I thought was very interesting is their acknowledgement of the fact that you don't always have absence of pain, right? You could have patients in the affected eye, maybe with persistent small epithelial defect where they actually report discomfort and have pain, but they have other concurrent risk factors such as persistent poorly controlled diabetes with or without lenticular changes, with or without visual consequences, because that, that's usually how we assess our diabetes patients, right? Asking about their fasting blood sugar, looking at their ocular changes. That's not necessarily because that's not necessarily the only thing that, that raises our suspicion about NK in a poorly controlled diabetic patient. Because remember, it's the chronic inflammation that causes damage to the ocular surface then to the nerves. It's not necessarily lenticular change. So make sure that you don't, kind of, you don't think that you only check if they have uh, really high spikes of sugar, uh, blood sugar, and then only if they have lenticular changes. Uh, that's not true. Um, so that I, I really do appreciate at least that finer point of patients with NK can have uh, discomfort and pain. Brendan, do you have any other comments you want to add to this paper? Yeah, well, you know, I completely agree, Clark. And we talked about this the other day where I, I completely understand why we need things like Delphi panels to put consensus papers out because there needs to be some kind of guidance in the literature and payers, insurance payers look to the literature for evidence as to you know what they should do, what they should cover and why. So if there's no literature, it's hard to get coverage. But really look, and, and I know many of the, the people on this Delphi panel and one, thank you guys for putting this panel together and getting a publication out, but two, this doesn't help me very much. I mean, when you look at it, you know, who do we test for NK for? Well, it's everybody at risk for NK. Well, I think what this paper really says is be on the lookout and test. And that's kind of the plea from everybody is you've got to, you know, have a, a high suspicion for this and you can't make the diagnosis without testing. Now, I don't agree with 14 days. For me, if someone's had a persistent epithelial defect for 14 days and it's not of an infectious etiology or at least an obvious infectious etiology, I'm already behind the ball. I'm already treating this patient for a non-healing epithelial defect or NK and I want them on medications and treatment right away. It doesn't take two weeks for a cornea to get better if, you know, unless it's perhaps an infectious etiology that, that hasn't been under control yet. And I've already had insurance payers ask me you know, can you document that this epithelial defect has been present for 14 days? And I don't, I don't want to wait till the 14th day to finally institute treatment. So myself, I'd rather say if you're suspicious that this cornea is not healing properly at a rate that you would expect and there's reduced sensation, for me, that's enough to diagnose this as neurotrophic keratitis and get that patient on proper treatment. So I, I appreciate the paper. But I, you know, it's a consensus paper, but I don't agree with some of that consensus. Right. And like I said, I think they, the, the, it's one of the first uh, consensus paper and it's staying on the conservative side, but it does have some valid points of pleading for corneal sensitivity testing. And, um, and also then, you know, in terms of the risk factors that we have talked about, 
what are some of the company that this condition keeps with itself? And remember, if, in case you still need some convincing thinking, I don't really have a whole lot of these patients, regardless of the risk factors that you had just laid out. Remember dry, we're talking about chronic uh, insult to the corneal surface, uh, chronic inflammation can cause damages uh, in an afferent situation, right? From your peripheral and organ corneal surface back to the, uh, to the uh, nerve plexus. So you dry patients, whether it's related to contact lens or not, your chronic condition of lid diseases and exposure, uh, keratitis, toc uh, toxicity, buildup such as your topical, you know, your glaucoma patient and limbo cell uh, deficiency. So those are all things that eventually uh, you could see that present coexist with NK or eventually can possibly lead to a secondary NK. So after, you know, so now we're thinking, yeah, you know, I do have a lot of those patients and I do now want to start testing them. And uh, the question is, you know, how do I classify this, these patients once I have them in my chair? Well, I like to look at, for me, I like to, there are obviously other classifications out there, but we, I, I like to look at Mackey's uh, classification system, which basically for me, I look at the level of the corneal tissue that's involved. If it's strictly just epithelium, irregular profile uh, of, of the epithelium punctate staining, that's your stage one. If it's down to the, um, you have epithelium, you have persistent epithelial defect, uh, but stroma is not affected. That's your stage two. If your stroma is affected all the way up to possibly impending perforation, melting and, and perforation, that would then be stage three whenever your stroma is affected. Um, so that's the way that I look at them. And they also, the reason that I think it's very important to look at different, to be able to classify these patients accurately is because the treatment goals are somewhat different at different stages. Now, again, with better treatment modality, uh, such as the Ninjaman nerve growth factor substitute that we could use, um, both Brenda and I feel like, because we have talked about this, we should probably push some of the treatment modality forward so that we could treat them at an earlier stage. But really at stage one, you're looking at improving the epithelial quality. It's, you know, so, so they're easier to manage at that point. At stage two, when you have persistent non-healing defect, but stroma is not affected, really we're trying to prevent further stroma uh, uh, involvement. And then at stage three, when the eye is extremely sick now with the ocular surface, we're really trying to stop melting from leading into perforation and the need for other more invasive um, interventions that honestly won't have very good outcome anyway, because the patient doesn't have any protective uh, reflexes and sensation on the corneal surface. So this is what I was talking about. There are different treatment options that Brendan's going to discuss in a little bit. And looking at sort of, you know, medical literature, you show you that something like a nerve growth factor or scleral lenses should be stage three. Now, I really, I think due to the advancement of uh, treatment modalities, such as having as access to synodromen and also the advancement in scleral lens um, manufacturing ability, um, I really feel like at the very least, I, I personally will move those two all the way to stage one. What do you think, Brendan? Yeah, you know, Clark, I, I completely agree. And and if you can go back one slide for me, or maybe I can go back one slide. Um, this this reminds me, and these slides remind me so much of the original Delphi panel or the Dues One back in 2006, 2007, when we had a newly approved medication for dry eye in the form of Restasis, where we were reserving and recommending the use of Restasis for more severe dry eye. Um, that was kind of the initial push. And, and now we have a newly approved medication for neurotrophic keratitis and synedromin or recombinant human nerve growth factor. But just the other day, I had a patient with, you know, severe ulceration, non-healing defect. We did all kinds of treatment. And I was so excited because I, we finally had a healed epithelial defect. And to me, it was like a major victory. And you're doing so well. You know, your eye is so much safer. This, now we can start taking away some of these medications. And at the end, after feeling like a hero and I saved this patient, you know, the patient looks at me and says, well, am I ever going to be able to see? Right, patients want to see. We're happy sometimes to get these bad problems healed. We feel like, all right, you know, at least we're not gonna have to worry about this eye coming out of the head. Patients wanna see better. 
And so when it comes to treating neurotrophic keratitis on this scale, that mild stage one patient still has neurotrophic keratitis, just like that stage three patient. And if we had been more proactive in that stage one, we likely could have prevented this patient from going to stage two and stage three, where even if we're very successful and go through heroic efforts to heal up that neurotrophic cornea, it's still a scarred, misshapen cornea that may need corneal transplant or stem cell transplant or scleral lens. And not that scleral lenses are a bad thing, but it's a lot more work for the patient. And I would imagine if you could ask any patient wearing scleral lenses, hey, would you rather have perfect vision without a scleral lens or wear a scleral lens? Most of them would probably say, hey, I wouldn't mind not having to wear this. So I think being proactive and adding these treatments that we would say are for stage two or stage three earlier on. Now, certainly not corneal transplants and things like that, but reasonable treatments. And I would put Sernedrimin in there early on because the more we talk about Sernedrimin and the more we publish Sernedrimin as being a stage two and stage three treatment, the harder it is for us to get it for those stage one patients who may actually get more benefit from it than those patients in stage two or stage three when it comes to better vision. And Brendan, that's actually why patients like to see me more than seeing you because I make them see better. Um, <laughs> you do. Yeah, I take their cornea off <laughs> and then I send them to see you to see better. But in any case, <laughs> just a different perspective of looking at the all the treatment option we laid out, including topical, what's in office, and hopefully combining both of those prevents us to having to rely on, you know, tosorophy and other surgical interventions that Brendan's going to touch up on in a few seconds. And so obviously, I don't think I need to talk too much about scleral lenses because it's not within the scope of uh, of, of this course and in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, fast forward, but and it, the pictures at least show you how fast we can help with the healing of the epithelium just by isolating and properly protecting the epithelium when you couldn't do that with the lids. However, I think it's worth mentioning and, and thinking when we're reconstructing that environment underneath the surface of the scleral lens to make it protective for the epithelium, we need to think about the you know, the pH, the buffer and the osmolarity and the preserve and, and obviously keeping everything preservative free. So this is a table that I made up in a, um, that I created for a chapter contribution that I recently wrote. So I just want to leave that in the handout for everybody kind of refer to as to what is currently uh, available on the market and what their characteristics are. Um, speaking of the, you know, overlapping characteristic with dry eye, we know that autologous serum is used a lot for dry eye, but now also Brendan's going to talk to us about using this in NK patients. Brendan? So the, the bottom line here is what do you do? You know, we've talked about looking for NK, we've showed how to test for it, we've recommended testing for it, but once you make the diagnosis or you have the suspicion, what can you actually do to treat these patients? And uh, we have a series of treatments, not necessarily lined up in simplicity uh, order, but one of the number one things that we use in our office is autologous serum eye drops. Uh, we have the benefit of having a centrifuge in multiple offices. And I've been drawing blood on my patients for probably 12 to 13 years and making them autologous serum. We typically start with about 10%. And this has been, this has been, you know, tried and true. We didn't, you know, I certainly didn't make autologous serum up, and it's been written up in, in multiple peer-reviewed literature uh, papers about the the benefit of autologous serum. And we think it's basically just taking the, the growth factors and the trophins that are in the serum, uh, and then in a more concentrated fashion, putting them directly back on the eye. So even diluted autologous serum at 20% has a much higher concentration of nerve growth factor, epithelial growth factor, TGF beta, insulin-like growth factor you know, than is in the, the tear film. So we think adding those trophic factors back to the ocular surface both help, helps with the patient's symptoms as well as the clinical signs of severe ocular surface disease, including neurotrophic keratitis. And that's been shown uh, in, in multiple studies. It really does work exactly how it's still a little bit of a mystery, but it does, and there's not necessarily a standard formulation. But in those severe patients, preservative-free is certainly preferred, although many of the patients that I personally make autologous serum for do have a very dilute preservative, uh, more for uh, the, my fear of causing an infection with a tampered drop. We simply draw blood. We use what's called a tiger top tube, which has a serum separator. We centrifuge it for about 20 minutes. We draw off the serum and then dilute it into an artificial tear. 
For me, four tubes will give a patient enough for a three month supply, but depending on your recipe, who makes it, is it done at a pharmacy, they may need a lot more blood than just four tubes. And if we give a patient a three month supply, we see them back in a couple months, if it's working well and they want to use more serum, we'll go ahead and make them more autologous serum. Now a self-retaining uh, amniotic membrane is an easy procedure to do in the office and it does work well. Um, my bias, and this is a bias, is to use the cryopreserved or frozen AMT. This is a, a proprietary amniotic membrane that's suspended on a thermoplastic ring. It's basically a contact lens that you can place in the eye. There are other forms. There are now multiple forms of amniotic membranes, including some dehydrated forms that are much easier to store. They're also significantly less expensive. The dehydrated AMT would be placed on the ocular surface underneath a bandage contact lens to help keep it in place. And they do have a, a, a protective or bandage approval on them. The cryopreserved or frozen AMT has a double approval. One is for protecting the ocular surface or a bandage. Uh, the other is actually it is a pro uh, healing or uh, anti-inflammatory function. So it is double approved. Uh, and so for me, most of the time I'm using the frozen AMT, but it is not wrong to use either one, whichever one you have in the office. I think thinking of it and doing it is the important thing. Which one you choose is up to the surgeon, uh, sorry, or up to the practitioner. Uh, it, it does help with epithelialization. In our own study, we showed that the AMT can stay in the eye for up to two weeks before breaking down. And it's been shown to decrease the time to re-epithelialization. The tarsorophy is maybe the least enjoyable thing that we do, and it's one of those things that patients really don't want. But for some reason, when we suture the upper lid to the lower lid for a week or two, it really improves epithelialization times. Uh, not fun to do, not fun to have, but we will employ that when there's just no other way. And this can be done in the office or it can be done in the operating room. We typically are doing temporary tarsorophies unless, unless it's absolutely necessary or we think it's a, a lid malfunction issue and we need to shorten the lid fissure, then something like a, a canthoplasty or permanent tarsorophy can be uh, employed. That's not going to be in my hands. I typically send that to a plastic or oculoplastic surgeon. Multiple layer AMTs, bandage contact lenses can also be placed. Uh, conjunctival flaps, we rarely do because they are going to take away vision. But if you need to stop a thinning cornea with a, a non-healing epithelial defect and lack of sensation or stage two or stage three NK, a conch flap can work. Neurotoxins, Botox, gold weights. Don't forget about the punctal plug. You know, we tend to get moving pretty quickly in the office and I often forget how powerful just a, a silicone punctal plug can be to elevate the tear prism, shortening the interpalpebral space. I'm reminded time after time by some of my senior colleagues, hey, when you got a neurotrophic cornea, add a plug, it really works. And it does very quick in the office, not painful for patients, but this works very well at helping spread the tear film, elevating the tear film and healing epithelial defects. And it is so simple uh, and patients don't mind it one bit. Surgical treatments for NK. Corneal neurotization is a, uh, has been introduced over the past couple of years. And this is a fantastic technique where we basically are borrowing a nerve assuming there's a functioning nerve on the contralateral side of the eye, doing a fairly major stage surgery, typically borrowing the sural nerve and putting it into, the, into your, the head basically and attaching it to a functioning nerve, allowing that to heal for a while and then in a staged fashion, attaching it to the other cornea to try and actually regain sensation. It is a fantastic technique and it is fantastically difficult. Multidisciplinary as far as the, the, the surge is necessary, very time consuming. Uh, there are multiple techniques described, some of them including basically, you know, de-gloving the face to get to the nerves and then putting it back together. Mm -hmm. It is a major surgery. And unfortunately, uh, although it is successful, it is not wildly successful. Uh, but in some cases, it has restored sensation and then improved the ocular surface. So direct neurotization of the cornea is a possibility. Uh, I have not uh, undertaken any of these myself, but other members of the cornea service uh, have. I, I think we have seen two patients with this done uh, with decent success. But a lesser invasive technique certainly would be appreciated. And don't forget about the 
the scleral lens. Yeah, I think the scleral lens is a is a fantastic technique for restoring the ecosystem. This is actually Clark's case. And Clark, why don't you let us know what you did here? Yeah, and, and Brendan, just uh, echoing what you said, also fantastically difficult to uh, have to do this after uh, neurotization. So this is one of the one of the uh, hypoesthesia patients that I mentioned. This one doesn't have the skin nodules, but she. Uh, I'm actually amazed at how cl relatively clear her cornea looks because she's had that diagnosis ever since two years old, according to her, and only a few years ago had the neurotization. She says that she get, she got some sensation back to the point now she feels the scleral lens. So she didn't like the fitting of her prior scleral lenses uh, on the eye and then asked me to, um, uh, to help her out. I will only tell you that I, I wanna skip to other treatment options. Uh, very difficult to really fit over a standard scleral lens. I had to rely on impression technique. Uh, impression molding, such as eye print to actually be able to give her, even then I, I had to um, make alteration to the default design. So another day, maybe we'll, we'll share a complete case, but let's go to a uh, Sanijiman. So maybe the, the, the biggest breakthrough in neurotrophic keratitis over the past couple of years has been Sinetrimin, which is uh, approved since 2018 for the treatment of neurotrophic keratitis. And note, it's not stage two or stage three. It is all forms of neurotrophic keratitis. It is a recombinant human neurogrowth growth factor. It is structurally identical to what is found in the body, and it is for NK. And I really have to give Dom Pei credit for getting this study through the FDA. Now, luckily, neurotrophic keratitis is considered a rare disease. And when you have a rare disease, it does make it a little bit easier to do an FDA study because you can use lower numbers of patients. And the FDA, in this case, allowed us to use European data uh, included in the US FDA study. And that is not typically uh, what they do. So the two studies that were done, one is the European study or the Reparo study, which we're, was using Synedrimin for the treatment of stage two and stage three neurotrophic epithelial defects, followed for uh, a eight week course, and then actually followed for up to uh, actually for a year after the treatment. The US study was very similarly uh, structured using um, Synedrimin for eight weeks in stage one, sorry, stage two and stage three NK, and then following. Now, the endpoints that the FDA set was healing of the epithelial defect by eight week, by week eight, healing of the epithelial defect and complete healing of the ocular surface. So in the Reparo study or the European data, they would allow actually half a millimeter of remaining epithelial defect and you could have some staining on the cornea. So when you are looking at that slide above you, that upper row is what was considered success in the Reparo trial. The lower uh, series of four pictures is what was success at eight week in the US trial. So they had to recompile the European data to fit what the US was, was looking for. So the data data that we see in this trial is actually looking at the same endpoint, but they weren't exactly the same study. But the take home point here is that after eight weeks of using Synedrimin, and that was being used uh, every two hours or at least six times a day, about 72%, two thirds of our patients had a healed epithelial defect with no SPK or PEE on the cornea anywhere. I mean, I, I think that is absolutely amazing. So even more patients actually had a healed epithelial defect, but some stain, so they didn't hit the endpoint. But for these patients where nothing else worked to get 72% of them healed at eight weeks by using Synedrimin, for me, it's just a fantastic number and no remaining punctate staining on the cornea. So we all know that getting somebody to heal in the short run is great, but we have to keep these patients healthy forever. Doing a tarsorophy, placing a bandage contact lens, we can sometimes get the cornea to heal, but you take away that treatment and the cornea decompensates. Well, looking over the course of a year, 80% of the patients who were healed at week eight remained healed for the remaining, of the remaining year. So not only do we get a short-term improvement by adding Oxervate, uh, I'm sorry, adding Synedrimin eight times a day or six times a day for eight weeks gets the epithelium healed, but that effect remains for an extended period of time. So that really means we're, we're getting better safety for our patients and getting the epithelium to heal. And we are keeping them healed for an extended period of time. And I think that's really important. If you're looking at your watch, you know we have only a minute or two left. So I'm gonna go through a very quick case 
of a patient who was sent to me with a dislocated IOL. We took this patient to the OR, we refixated the implant, and then eventually sent this patient back to the referring doctor. I thought that I was a hero because I, I fixed his eye, he had better vision, back in the hands of the referring doctor. And then about eight or nine weeks after that surgery, he was returned to me for reduced vision. He had already been tried on multiple medications, and I'm just waiting for my slide. There we go. He'd been on antibiotics several times. They tried therapeutic contact lenses with no success. And I'm not even sure why this guy is back, but I, I thought that he was fixed and I had him, you know, was a home run. And now he's back in my office for another problem. AMTs, BCLs, antibiotics all tried. And this is what he came to me with. This was a small neurotrophic looking epithelial defect right over top of my incision that had not healed now for over uh, a month. Well, we did our usual epithelial defect protocol, you know, tears, uh, punctal plugs, cultures to make sure this wasn't an infectious etiology. We did place this patient on Synedrimin. He had an eight-week course using Synedrimin six times a day, continuing with artificial tears and a punctal plug. Cultures were negative, and very, very quickly, we were able to restore his ocular surface, and the vision also returned to his uncorrected vision of 2030. Just a quick image of his ocular surface just after a few weeks, and this has been maintained over the course of now about two years. So relatively quick effect, six times a day, and maintained for an extended period of time, which is very, very important for ocular health and the sanity of our patients. So I'd love to fast forward here. We're almost at the end. I want to talk about one more uh, product, which is called Travaya. We, uh, we were part of a large group using a electric stimulator for nerve health and for ocular surface disease. Neurostim has become a hot topic now. The original uh, true tier device, which was a intranasal electric stimulator, worked fantastically well, but it had a stigma with it uh, of putting a device up your nose and shocking. The people called it the nasal defibrillator, even though it wasn't really a noxious stimulus. Well, now we have uh, Varencycline, which is the same medication as Chantix, the anti-smoking medication, that's in a nasal spray. This actually activates by spraying it into the nose. It is not an inhaled medication. It's sprayed in the nostril, one puff twice a day, both sides. It actually activates their trigeminal nerve and increases tear production. Now, that little gizmo you see on the right is an external nasal stimulator. It's a little vibrating uh, uh, protrusion. You put it right uh, above the external uh, meatus here and it stimulates the, the nerve. Now this has been partially developed by Laura Perriman and you see her reference there. I was actually sitting next to her on a panel. She pulled this little device out, stuck it on my nose and turned it on. And immediately, besides you know tickling like crazy, but immediately I noticed an increase in tear production for probably four or five hours after about a, a five second stimulation on my nose. Now this data you're seeing is from Travaya or Vrencycline uh, used over the course of 12 weeks sprayed in the nose twice a day. And you do see a significant improvement in Shermers by using this twice a day and it lasts over time. So you do not acclimate, you don't habituate to this medication. It works each and every time you use it. We now have patients using this medication, some of which have stated it is the best uh, medication that they have used. Now, I, we included this today because Travaya or Vrencycline is in trials right now for NK. The approval right now is to increase Shermer production for dry eye, but we do think this may become another medication that has the approval for neurotrophic keratitis. So on that, we are about three or four minutes past our time. We apologize. Um, but I think we have still maybe some time for, for questions if we are allowed.